Hi, welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by Justin Bailey. Justin is Theology and Apologetics Editor at Premier Christianity, which is Britain's leading Christian magazine, and he presents the Stellar Saturday Morning Radio Show and the podcast, Unbelievable. And indeed, he presents also the fortnightly Ask N.T. Write Anything podcast. Uh, so just to begin then, Justin, can you tell us please a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped to form you and your love for Christ and his church? Oh, well, thank you, Mark. It's great to join you on, on the podcast today. Um, yeah, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, and uh, in that sense, church going was part of the norm for me growing up, a sort of evangelical, charismatic kind of church that I found my own faith in. It was probably around the age of 15, though, that it really came alive for me personally. And that was through the um, the help of a, a, a youth leader and a youth group that I was part of. Um, and and so that that, you know, once things did come alive for me you know I think that sort of transformed my my way of thinking about Christianity and the faith that began then has you know matured and evolved over the years obviously um I went off to university um and again discovered a whole new kind of different way of looking at Christianity lots of my friends didn't come from the same tradition as me but that that you know and especially I met my wife now wife Lucy at university and she came from a very different kind of church background to me and so that was that was a whole process really of, of learning to appreciate different traditions in Christianity um, but um, but I it also birthed a, a passion for um, the creative arts and that kind of thing I, I'd always been into drama and um, so at university I actually ended up um, being the president of something called the Christian Arts and Drama Society um, it was a sort of evangelistic group that did sort of skits out on the streets or at events and things like this um, and, uh, and, and I sort of had in my mind, I wanted to do something, you know, creative in, in to do with Christian ministry, you know, once I left university and, and the opportunity came up, um, I went on a gap year just after getting married to Lucy. Um, and the, 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 the head of the charity that we were working for on the gap year in Africa, when he visited us said, um, Hey, I've just been on this Christian radio station in London. Um, I know you're interested in journalism and that kind of thing, Justin, why not, you know, get in touch with them, which I did from, from Namibia where we were at the time. And that turned into when I, we returned um, work experience, which turned into a job, which turned into eventually uh, the unbelievable radio show and podcast, which mm -hmm. has taken on a life of its own in all kinds of other ways uh, over the last 15 years or so. So that's, that's the very brief story of, of, of my, <laughs> my journey and how it led up to where, where we are now. Fantastic. Thank God. And then um, were there any other persons you mentioned there, the youth uh, pastor that was helping, helpful towards you? Are there any other persons who've been particularly um, inspirational or influential for you as you went along that journey? Yeah, well, I, I've already mentioned one of them, which is my wife, Lucy, you know, who, who definitely um, had a huge influence on me when I met her in terms of mm -hmm. Um, just as I say, broadening my my the scope of what I knew of Christianity, which which you know in a way had been a, a very specific tradition that I'd grown up in. Um, but Lucy was someone who went uh, was very involved in her the chapel um, at her Oxford College where she was at, and um, and and it, you know if I'm fair, I probably sort of turned my nose up a little bit at the more traditional end of the church. Mm -hmm. But that was a really helpful route into actually seeing the value in those kinds of traditions. At that point, um, she come she came from a United Reformed Church background, which again was different um, in terms of her home church, and that's the tradition we're in now. Actually, she's a minister in the United Reformed Church, and um, but she was she, she really used her time at university to really explore lots of different Christian traditions. She would go off and see the Catholics and the High Church and the Evangelicals and the Baptists and you know and and uh, and and so that was you know a really interesting way of being able to kind of engage with those different traditions and appreciate them more. So Lucy was definitely a big a big influence. I mean, the people I read were also you know as I was going through those those formative years, I would say. I was reading a lot of C.S. Lewis uh, and people like that. And they, that was really speaking to me on an intellectual level about the, the case for Christianity and that kind of thing. Um, and so, so there were definitely sort of authors as well along the way who I'd say were, were, were pretty influential. Mm, thanks for sharing that Justin and uh, I want to move on next if we may to speak about your show and indeed your book Unbelievable Why After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists I'm Still a Christian so first I should say that your work has actually been quite inspirational to me to have better uh, conversations and to listen to people that's great 
different levels you know you're listening to their emotions you're listening to what they're saying yeah. in very propositional ways and uh, it's partly inspired more christ so i think uh, even though maybe stylistically in some ways my focus might be different like in the sense that sometimes at least you'll bring the extremes together you'll focus on debate and things like that and i think that uh, complements what i'm doing which is speaking more with christian academics specifically mm. oftentimes and um i think um it's all about showing Christ's truth is total and how that affects every area of life. Mm. Uh, or at least that, that's my uh, take on it. So um, then, Justin, what are some of the factors and tips that you actually think are important in having these high quality conversations then? Yeah, um, I, I think I think it is to go in with a genuinely open heart, you know, to listen to what someone's saying um, and not necessarily just to go in to kind of beat them down or prove them wrong or, or whatever <laughs> I, I think people you know realize um especially in our day-to-day -day conversations i mean obviously what i do on the show is is very different to what a, a normal conversation looks like on the street because it's it is it is by nature quite staged you know when i'm bringing two people on my show nevertheless i think you're right i think you can still learn something from those those conversations about the way you hold yourself carry yourself um for me it's really important especially for christians to to not not um, not react with fear to positions that they disagree with or um, whatever. Um, I think very often the problem I see is, um, especially in the social media area, is is people taking offence essentially at ideas that they disagree with, and and I just don't think that's a helpful way in. Um, uh, I think it's always important to treat the other person as a human being, uh, someone made in the image of God, uh, and and to, to be prepared to listen to them and to entertain you know their their idea and and to give it a fair hearing uh certainly then we're called to make a case for why we maybe take a different view why we do believe you know in jesus and own and or indeed you know a particular aspect of christianity that, that we hold dear and uh, uh but to do you know i i can't really improve on on what first peter three fifteen says you know which is always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that's in you, but do this with gentleness and respect. So it's the gentleness and respect thing that often gets forgotten, unfortunately, in our conversations. And I think just modeling that to some extent uh, on the show has been helpful for a lot of Christians. But I do think there's, you know, there's a value. And I don't know if you're a regular listener, Mark, but, but I think for people who kind of end up listening to the show week in, week out, maybe for years on end, they you do sort of pick up just not only um there were well, two things i think you pick up information uh so you kind of you're more prepared to deal with and answer and have a confident kind of conversation with someone who disagrees with you and certainly for me that's been the case of doing this show now for 15 plus years is i've had a real i, I, I it enable me to kind of put pieces of a very big puzzle together and and to kind of have an idea of, of where I stand on various issues and how they interlock and where therefore where where I'm going when it comes to having a conversation with a skeptic or someone who who disagrees with me but but the the other most you know arguably just as important part of that is that the the way that those conversations are carried and um and not to conduct them in a kind of knee-jerk fear-based way but to do them in a kind of open-handed kind of way where you're genuinely open to what the other person has to say um you're not scared of what they're going to say um and and you're willing to to you know have that kind of a dialogue and i think you'd be surprised at how far that goes in actually helping skeptics especially to take you seriously i think i think a skeptic immediately will know if you're just there to basically win an argument and mm -hmm. and at that point i think the the, the shutters come down a bit in terms of their any kind of willingness to actually move themselves because it, it's if it's being cast as a you know we're winners only debate then mm -hmm. uh, that's the way people will engage with it and um whereas i think you you, you you end up having far more in the long run fruitful conversations when you're genuinely open to to being persuaded in different directions you know Mm, I think so, Justin. And then I think building on that, um, what are we listening for then beyond the quite ostensible and maybe propositional claims that people make? 
I, I think even the way we often speak about aren't we so rational or open-minded and we tend to think uh, often in these slogans and crude notions of what it means to be human and uh, even within a kind of social construct where we think that we're primarily rational creatures and um, would you like to speak to that point about how we can uh, speak to the whole person as you sort of suggested before? Mm, yeah. No, I think I think you're right, and and I think that's one of the great dangers of of the area that I work in, apologetics, is it does tend to speak just to the, what is, I always forget whether it's the left or the right brain, which is the kind of <laughs> rational bit, and the other bits, the you know creative, intuitive yeah. bit, and so on. But um, whichever side it is, the apologetics tends to just speak to that that side of the the brain, and very often because it is concerned very frequently just with the intellectual objective arguments and so on, and. Um, and what I often see, unfortunately, in apologetics is is that's where the danger comes that that it turns it into a an intellectual game, you know. Um, and and a lot of apologists go about thinking, well, if I can just present the very best case, the most <laughs> undefeatable arguments, then of course people will become Christians. Why wouldn't they? Um, but of course, as as we all know, that isn't <laughs> the, the way most people actually. People, you know, and and actually there's been some fascinating psychological research on this, hasn't there, from people like Jonathan Haidt, if you read his book, books there, the, the, the idea that actually um, intelligent people tend to just use their intellect to um, make the best case for what they already believe in their heart, basically, that actually very often the intellect, that while we all like to claim we're all these blank pages and we're, you know, just ready to be persuaded by the best arguments <laughs> actually we've all got a gut as well mm -hmm. and we what actually tends to happen is we use the intellect to reinforce what we already believe um so i think i think it's fascinating because because we've all we're all in that sense uh, whether we call ourselves an atheist christian or something else we've all got a worldview that kind of is where we start actually and which we tend to to then filter things through to a large degree to some extent, you know, part of the challenge in apologetics is taking off the blinders and, and you know, inviting people to try and, you know, genuinely look at things in a, in a more unbiased way. And that's part of what it is, you know, to develop critical thinking skills. But beyond all of that, um, when it comes to the actual, you know, let's face it, apologetics is ultimately about persuading people of the Christian faith. Um arguments and intellect alone won't do it for most people i mean there might be a very few who you know are so kind of left brain or right brain or whichever it is that that they could be taken down that road purely by those arguments but most people are a, a very much a mixture of heart and soul and mind and um and they're going to be reading you know the way you are just as much as the things you say which again is why I think the first Peter 315 principle is, is so important. Do it with gentleness and respect. You know, you might have the best argument in the world, but if the person you are, as you deliver those arguments, makes me think, actually, I don't really want to be that kind of a person, then it doesn't matter how good your argument is, you're not going to persuade someone to, to, to join you uh, in being a Christian. And likewise, um, you know, the best apologists have always been people like C.S. Lewis, who, who brought... The imagination and the intellect together you know who was able to convey why you want this to be true not just uh why it's true so so that they they make you want it to be true just as much as showing you why it's true if that makes sense and that's that's that that's the magic um missing ingredient very often in apologetics it's it's speaking to the heart as well as to the mind and, and when you've got both of those together it can be very powerful but unfortunately very often people either go totally in one direction, like, you know, hey, Christianity is all about having this wonderful emotional subjective experience. <laughs> uh, and then everyone who, you know, likes to engage their rational faculty says, well, Christianity is not for me then. Mm -hmm. Or they go in the other direction and say, it's all about just, you know, looking at these arguments and deciding what's true. And that doesn't speak to people's emotions. Uh, and it's got to be both if we're going to actually win someone. Mm, I mean, and um, then taking that into consideration, Justin, how do you manage to host these conversations in a way that keeps them so cordial between people? Um, well, uh, a lot of it is obviously down to the people I select. You know, if I select two really dogmatic, you know, <laughs> argumentative types, then no matter how good my hosting skills are, they're probably going to end up arguing. 
and that has happened on some shows you know there's some shows where i maybe didn't intend it this way but it came out too you know it, 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 there was more hot air than than light produced in the course of it so I, I i have to be responsible in who i bring together and make sure that actually this is going to be a fruitful discussion mm -hmm. i still want some spark and some drama you know uh, i i don't want to put on a <laughs> program where everyone just sits around and is terribly polite and agrees with each other on everything but um but but nonetheless you know you so, it, so there's that part of it but then yeah i, I think um I try to do my best. I am a Christian. I'm, I'm obviously don't hide that. Um, it's broadcast on a Christian network. It's um, that, that's where I'm coming from. But when I'm in the moderator seat, I do try and, and uh, sort of take, put on my neutral moderator's hat and try and give fair time to both sides. Um, question both sides. If I feel like, you know, the Christian hasn't explained something well, or the non-Christian hasn't make sure that, hopefully the best arguments are being delivered that I'm not just straw manning, you know, bringing or, or anything when, when it comes to the people I'm inviting. So, so all of that, I think helps to set the stage for what will hopefully be then a, a good conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and although obviously, especially during pandemic, we've done the vast majority of the shows have been remotely recorded. Um, and it's always best ideally to have people in studio together because, uh, you know, there's a lot that happens in that interpersonal dialogue. I do think just having people in a sense, at least face to face, even if it's on a screen, helps versus the kind of dialogues, for want of a better word, that happen on, you know, social media and Facebook, where the anonymity of being behind a keyboard tends to often sadly bring out the worst in people. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a bit harder to be really rude to someone's face when you're looking them in the eye, you know? So, um, so I think that helps the, the kind of the format and, and everything else. And, and I try to, you know, I'm quite, um, I'm, 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 I'm I, for whatever reason, God has given me the ability to, to remain fairly calm myself uh, in the midst of, you know, sometimes heated discussions. And I do what I can to make sure that if, if the temperature gets too high, I inject a little bit of humor or something just to, to kind of dissipate things and move the conversation on if it's kind of getting bogged down and that kind of thing. So these, it's just the stuff you learn uh, after doing it for, for quite a while. Mm. And um, can you tell us just uh, one or two of those very hurry moments that you may have experienced over the years and what made them so, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, at, at the extreme end, you know, I remember the show when I brought um, a Muslim and a Christian together. Now the Muslim was in studio and the Christian was on the phone line. Mm -hmm. This is going back quite a few years. And the and and in a sense, I you know, this is arguably one of those ones where I brought it upon myself because the um the Christian was quite a well known as being quite vociferous and um arguably anti-Islam, um, though he would say he's you know just being a, a an evangelist to Muslims, but um his and but it was a controversial subject. Um he was his content uh he was making the case that muhammad never really existed that that all we have is you know completely sort of unreliable accounts of muhammad's life and so on that if there was a muhammad the, the, what we have in the quran and the hadiths and so on is barely you know uh any kind of representation of him uh which as you can imagine does not go well down well with most mm -hmm. muslims and um so uh, and because I also had a very feisty character on the other side, it quickly got very argumentative and then, frankly, insulting. You know, there were insults being traded. And I had to at one point just pause the recording and say, gents, I'm not going to be able to carry on if, 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 if this keeps going. We kind of got there in the end. <laughs> but a lot of people, you know, wrote in afterwards and said, I couldn't I couldn't listen to all of that, Justin. You know, that was too hard. So that's on the extreme end. Um I mean, there have been some really interesting feisty debates. I mean, I, I run a, um, a video series from Unbelievable called The Big Conversation, um, which is done in partnership with the Templeton Foundation. Uh, so we've just concluded season three of that um, with some great thinkers across the religious and non-religious spectrum, people like Bishop Barron, uh, Bishop Robert Barron and Alex O'Connor, who's a well-known atheist YouTuber, um, kicked off the series. And we've had lots of debates on science and philosophy, 
uh, artificial intelligence, origins of life, uh, Judaism and Christianity, fine tuning of the universe. Um, and, and by and large, those have all been very respectful, very, um, you know, uh, and you can you can find all of those at the big conversation dot show. Um, one one that sticks in my memory, though, from season two, um, that was perhaps one of the most feisty debates um, I've done in, in recent years was um, Tom Holland came on. Tom Holland is a uh, a historian who's written a quite significant book uh, in the last couple of years called Dominion, which is the really the, a, a book looking at the way Christianity, the Christian revolution shaped the Western world in terms of our values, democracy, science, all kinds of areas that, that, that people who call themselves humanists today, for instance, you would argue, you know, secular humanists, he'd say, sorry, but all you're doing is regurgitating what Christianity gave us. And he makes this very powerful argument, even as a secular historian himself. I brought him on um, to debate that with AC Grayling, who's a well-known atheist philosopher in the UK. And he had recently published a book of his own, uh, sort of a history of the philosophy of the West. Um, and, um, and basically taken a very, very different take on, <laughs> on the world mm -hmm. and philosophy and culture and ethics to, to Tom Holland in which he basically began that book by saying, well, the problem is that Christianity destroyed all of the great works of ancient culture. And, you know, if it wasn't for Christianity, you think how much further down the road would be and da, da, da. So it basically took the view that Christianity was this terrible, you know, scourge on modern culture that if it hadn't happened, we'd, we'd all be just so much more cultured and better off. Whereas which is the complete opposite thesis to Tom Holland's, which is everything you appreciate and enjoy about modern culture is basically because of Christianity. So I brought these two together, but I, even I wasn't expecting quite how much the sparks would fly in mm -hmm. that debate that where we where we talked about history and Christianity. Um, they really went for each other in some ways. Uh, I mean, the first half an hour is just like I barely got a word in. It was just like back and forth, back and forth, both kind of really kind of going for their positions. T Tom getting more kind of worked up than I've ever seen him in any <laughs> other scenario because he just felt the things that AC Grading was saying was so wrong, was so <laughs> false. Um, and, and, um, and, and even like producing, as you know, sometimes on the spot, a little kind of, he had this, this little list um, ready. Um, it was at some point in the, the recording, AC Grading was, was talking about, you know, the way we, you know, we don't need Christianity, humanism kind of just works on the basis of shared ethical principles and this kind of thing. And, and Tom Holland basically pulled out this list he'd prepared of, <laughs> let me just tell you where all of the humanist conferences over the last 50 years have happened. And apart from like one or two, he said, they have all happened in Christian countries, in countries. He said, that is not an accident. Okay. There's no accident. You know. uh, so it was just the, the most interesting, lively, sparky debate. Um, and I would just got to enjoy being in the middle of it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that that's one of those ones where it was just on the edge of getting kind of, you know, may, maybe I, I was going to have to step in and just get everyone to calm down a bit. But they stayed just about at a kind of, you know, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, polite level, let's say, even, even <laughs> got, got kind of. Yeah. So that's always that's one that's definitely worth going and watching. It's on our YouTube channel. It's at the big conversation dot show. It's um, it's called something like um, did. Um, Something like Christianity and history did. Um, do we owe do we owe our values to the Christian faith? Something like that. But Tom Holland and AC Grayling. If you just type that in, it'll come up on Google. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Justin. And um, I should say, even from my perspective, listening and watching, I have found even the ones that maybe aren't as a uh, sparky, say between Tom Holland and NT Wright, was also magnificent. Oh yeah, know, yeah. Theme and and and, and that's the other kind of end that. So we we frequently also do. Uh, I don't want to make out it's always these really combative dialogues. Um, we do kind of what I would call more collegial discussions, still often between people who maybe do take different perspectives on certain issues. Um, mm -hmm. But that was that was um, yeah that was even before the AC Grayling debate when Tom Tom Holland one of the first times he came in. And uh, N.T. Wright had just published, you know, this huge magisterial work on the life of the Apostle Paul, um, to which Tom Holland had given a sort of a glowing endorsement. But I was aware these two hadn't met each other, but that there was a lot that kind of they had in common. And so I just thought, let's let's get them in a studio together and, and talk it up. And, and that was one of those examples where, you know, again, I, I struggled to get a word in because they were just so <laughs> excited to talk to each other. But it was very friendly, very like, you know, 
and and very often you learn more in those kinds of ones where there's kind of more of a meeting of minds mm-hmm. um, and and you just get to enjoy two people really enjoying each other's company and be getting excited about the ways they're you know stimulating each other's thoughts and so on and there's some there's some great clips from that actually one of what one of the clips i really love and have shared frequently is is tom holland sort of talk about his own journey from having been a kind of fairly you know typical skeptical atheist um through actually his um coming to t- you know l- investigating and and looking into the history of the classical world he gradually realized how alien most of the classical cultures were to his way of thinking you know the roman culture the greek culture you know the the, the fact that slavery was just a given that you could treat people the way you could in those days that you know caesar you know um was paraded through the towns and cities on the basis of having slaughtered a million Gauls or whatever. He said, you know, that the value systems are just so patently different to what we believe in today in the West. Um, And he came to see the way that Christianity had fundamentally um, absolutely changed the the game on that. And, and the the way he put it was, even though he didn't, you know, he, he, he would say he struggled with, the if you like the metaphysical claims of christianity you know whether to call himself a christian he said in terms of my actual belief you know values and culture i am a christian you know i just can't deny that and 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 then there's this fascinating interaction with 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 nt Wright, just on the way that paul specifically had had been part of that that revolution of christianity so yeah another another good one to go and watch nt Wright and uh, tom holland on the show absolutely and um then between your show, as we're kind of hinting at, and between your book, I was wondering how have you discovered then, uh, as you describe, God making sense of human existence uh, generally mm. through uh, these diverse discussions with some of the greatest hearts and minds? I suppose in a way I've, I've very much been a student as I've gone along and found what for me is is I, the way I put put the pieces of the puzzle together, as it were. So from early on, you know, um, you know, when I started the show 15, nearly 16 years ago now, I, I was very much a beginner. Uh, I wouldn't even really, you know, have known what the word apologetics means. Um, and for those who don't perhaps know what it means, it just means the sort of intellectual defense of the faith. But the um, what I quickly learned was that um, there were lots of objections to Christianity out there lots of very clever atheists and skeptics and I was inviting them on my show and they were asking really hard questions about Christianity but I was trying to find the best Christian minds and thinkers to kind of go go against them and 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 so I was learning an awful lot in that process both the arguments for and against God and um, my book um, unbelievable why after 10 years of talking with atheists I'm still a Christian is the subtitle and and really that that it was at that 10 year mark of having done 10 years of these discussions. I thought, I think I know enough now to basically um, marshal what I think, in my opinion, this is the, this is my view on what the best arguments for Christianity are and how I would um, try to answer some of the best objections against it. And, 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 and one of the key kind of things, and I tried to explain this early on in the book, uh, for me was 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 coming to the realization that actually we all have a worldview um, and very and very often the problem was that that uh, you know I would see atheists online or coming on the show and saying basically hey look I you're the one you Christians with all the supernatural beliefs wacky ideas I'm just a neutral bystander you've got to convince me that you know the world is the way you say it is that there's a god that there's you know a holy spirit that Jesus did miracles um, and and it was almost as though all the burden of proof was on the Christian to, to do all the argumentation and that the atheist was just a sort of the natural position that the, the neutral what, what I quickly realized is no most atheists I meet actually do have a position themselves they have a set of beliefs ways of looking at the world what I would call a worldview uh, and and most of the ones I was invited on my show would ultimately even if they didn't immediately come out with it would subscribe to something like naturalism or scientific materialism or or something like that which is basically that um you know there there are no overarch there's no overarching meaning to anything that that the universe came from nowhere and is ultimately heading nowhere there's no ultimate purpose to this that life is essentially a cosmic accident um and uh and and all that ultimately exists is 
matter in motion, energy, the forces of nature and so on. And I quickly realized, okay, you've got a set of kind of fundamental assumptions about the way life is and the universe is there. And it has a, a corollary set of um, sort of uh, things that come out of that, you know, that, 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 that actually right and wrong morality doesn't exist in a kind of any objective sense on this kind of a worldview, um, that there is ultimately no purpose to life. There's no sort of, you know, purpose beyond the things that we decide to do with our life. Uh, even things like um, truth, justice, beauty, even um, logic and reason. Uh, there's lots of things that it's very hard, I would realized, to start to think about and ground on this worldview. So, so what I did with the book was I said, okay, I'm going to just take the things we know about the universe and the way we experience life and ask which worldview makes best sense of, of these things, the Christian worldview or the atheist naturalist worldview. And I look at, in the first three chapters, human existence, the fact we're here, um, human value, the fact that we, there is this belief in the intrinsic value and dignity of humans and human purpose, the idea that there is meaning to life and um, and that some things are, some lives are better lived in certain ways than other lives. And, um, and on the basis of this, I, my contention is just on those three things, and obviously I dig them out in some detail, I think Christianity makes better sense. The idea that there's a God behind the universe makes better sense of those three key things than the naturalistic worldview does. There's more evidence in a sense on the side of Christianity that makes sense of those, those, those things. And then I go on to talk about obviously why I believe that God has been made known to us in a historical way in the person of Jesus Christ, and obviously deal with some of the, the, the typical objections around suffering and that kind of thing. Um, but that, but I'd say at the center of it all was this, this key penny dropping moment that actually we all have a worldview. We all have, you know, you could put it this way. We all, we all have faith in something. Um, and, um, and what's really important in when we have dialogues is to, um, very often part of the work of the apologist is to help the non-Christian, the atheist, the skeptic realize what their own ultimate foundational assumptions are and to ask, where do you have evidence for that? Do you, can you actually, does your worldview allow you to ground those things? Cause I will frequently get into disputes on twitter with someone who says christianity is awful because it does this does that it treats people this way and the first thing i want to ask them is where do you get this moral framework in which you are judging christianity because i'd love to know how as an atheist you believe there there is a moral to-do list <laughs> out there in the world um and and very frequently i just find people often haven't even thought about that to be honest about why why they think there is a a way things ought to be in the world and, and how that would work if there is a, if actually we're just ultimately you know um collocations of atoms floating through an infinite cosmos but um yeah so anyway that's a very long answer i apologize to that <laughs> no, that's question great. thank <laughs> you justin and um i think alongside what you're saying there about the philosophical presuppositions of many physicalist people and how they don't examine those uh, epistemological or hermeneutical starting points oftentimes <clears throat> i think there's also the level of history which your show has established with as we hinted at with um, the likes of tom holland coming on and expressing how this has manifested itself through history and uh, i think in line with that there's a, a naivete of history or an ignorance of history and our place mm. within history and uh, that's something i try to unveil on my show even so i was wondering then what is the importance as it ties to our conversations that we're talking about, the importance of joining the conversation with those who are not alive today, this kind of notion from Chesterton, the democracy of the dead, and um, how has this maybe study of history and Christians going back beyond, say, as they going back to the church fathers, different people, how has that helped you in your uh, journey in Christian faith? Yeah, well, well, they, they say, don't they, that, that, you know, if you aren't reading at least as many dead people as living people, then you're, you're not really reading. Uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we tend to live, all of us, you know, like it or not, in a bit of a bubble, you know, chronological snobbery, as C.S. Lewis puts it, where we, we assume, well, the people who are writing today must be the most up to date, have the best ideas, um, be most on top of it. And, and actually, we're missing out on the wealth of the fact that, yes, 
people may not have known as much you know literal knowledge in terms of you know, we, we've advanced in terms of our scientific understanding of the world, but very frequently we've we've actually regressed in in terms of our actual sociological and psychological and spiritual kind of engagement and understanding with the world. And, and we need to go back to the people who <laughs> did that foundational work. You know, there's a reason why Christianity won in the end. Um, uh, it's because uh, it made sense of the world and of people. Now, that's not to say there aren't an awful lot of things that went wrong historic you know the, the the we could do a whole show on on some of the excesses and failures of christianity but nonetheless as a as a way of understanding the world it has had this remarkable ability to transform and adapt and you know drive cultures um forward um and and so we we have to understand that history and that you know and why that, that is in order to kind of understand where we're at now and my fear is, you know, this, this is a well-worn sort of subject in uh, uh, of late, but is that um, we have allowed our fascination and addiction to technology and the ability to kind of do what we want and transform ourselves into what we want to kind of overtake the wisdom of the Christian tradition, which has an awful lot to say about that and about ultimately the futility of that. Um, because um, we we do live in um, in an age where, despite all of the, the the marvelous abilities we have and technological progress, and arguably ethical progress, and even you know as Stephen Pinker would point out, as he did in, on one of my big conversations, you know all of this welfare progress. You know if you compare life expectancy today to two hundred years ago, or you know there's all kinds of markers which suggest we're we're advancing. And yet we have a mental health crisis on our hands, especially in our younger population. The rate of suicide, especially among men, is at an all-time high. Um, you know, there, there, there is this kind of general fatigue and um, uh, kind of distracted um, aspect to our lives um, in, in the age we live in. And... Um, Christianity has to be able to say something to that. We have to be able to say, okay, let just being able to, you know, do what we want to our bodies or have the next version of the iPhone is evidently not going to actually solve the deepest problems. And there are people who were writing thousands of years ago who, despite not having the things we have today, had far more fulfilled, harmonious lives because um and and we need to rediscover you know what that was um i ha had a really interesting chat actually quite recently on these sorts of subjects on my show with um john viveki who is a canadian psychologist and philosopher um and he's talked about the meaning crisis and uh, done a sort of whole course on that and i brought him into con into conversation with um sorab amari who's written a book called the unbroken thread which is about rediscovering the wisdom and 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 they had a really interesting conversation on along these lines and um i think there's a lot to be said about that about rediscovering that that ancient wisdom that they were both talking about mm, amen and um the wisest figure of all then what have you learned about uh, the real jesus as opposed to the stereotypes that are really common outside the church and then even the complacent shibboleth that many of us are used to even within the church yeah Oh, well, where do you begin? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I think that's it. I mean, Jesus um, is without doubt the most influential character in all of history, but also the most contested in the sense that inevitably Christians, you know, of different stripes will tend to make a Jesus in their own image, you know, whether it, and so uh, I look at some of the ways in which Jesus and Christianity is invoked in certain parts of the U S and think, that that is not a true representation of Jesus. But I also see on the other extreme, you know, the uber progressive sort of whatever side where Jesus is basically just a sort of glorified, you know, morality figure. Uh, I, I don't see that as helpful either. And and so we've always got this, this temptation to basically just um, marshal Jesus to our own causes, um, political, ideological causes, don't we? I think, I think that, the um, 
the great joy of, of part of what I've been doing, especially with people like N.T. Wright, is that firstly, yes, acknowledging we all come to the text with with our biases, with our, you know, <laughs> who we are and the culture we live in. That's always going to have an impact on the way you read and understand text. So we can't get away from that. But nevertheless, um, there has been an, an enormous um, advance, I'd say, in the last 50 to 100 years in kind of getting behind the text and, and sort of being able to actually understand the culture that Jesus himself lived in, spoke into, and and helping, and, and a lot of that, and it's not just N.T. Wright, many great scholars, Craig Keener, and um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, it's gone out of my head, but the guy who, who wrote the Jesus Through Middle East, Kenneth Bailey, um, but lots of scholars who have done this amazing work of, of kind of helping us really understand Jesus in his context and the church in its first century context, I think really helps to get back to what this was all about rather than transplanting it into some medieval or Protestant reformers or 21st century evangelical kind of gloss on, on the story. Um, and, 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 and that's no bad thing to sort of see Jesus on his own terms in that way. I think that's one of the best ways you can start to dig into what it was he came to do and how it then applies to our age rather than just sort of importing the values we have come up with and kind of just reading them back into Jesus. So for me, that's, that's been great do going on that historical journey, being able to understand Jesus in his own time. And, um, and, you know, we, we are blessed today to, to have more resources than we could dream of really in helping us to do that um, through scholarship, through online journals, through, you know, just lay, lay level, you know, resources that are now available on that kind of front. Mm, thank God. Um, I want to ask you next, Justin, if I may, about how the concerns and the conversations have changed from, say, the day of the new atheists to now, and what are some of the uh, intersections? So I know uh, you've spoken about Verveke there. You had Verveke on, you have people like Douglas Murray, the kind of agnostic and physicalists of different kinds, and um, the, you've got the emergence of this new woke religion, if we might call it that, a kind of physicalist religion. Um, what do you think are some of the interesting intersections mm. going on at the moment? And do you have any thoughts about what we might expect as Christians and how we might minister to the people in those ways? Yeah, well, this is actually, Mark, the subject of a book that I'm in the process of writing, actually. Uh, it's um, So the follow-up book, really, to, to my first book is kind of, I'm, I, I hope I'm not biting off more than I can chew here, but <laughs> I'm basically um, talking about the way the conversation has changed from the new atheism, which I think, to, to, to a large degree, is a spent force now. It had its zenith, really, with the publication of books like God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens and, and the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and others, um, but it now tends. It's now uh, it it still has its corner on the internet, you know, and you still find the angry atheists um, who you know hate religion. But by and large, it doesn't have the kind of um, cultural cachet that it once seemed to occupy. Um, it, it's and to a large degree, uh, as I sort of explore in the opening chapter of this book I'm writing, um, it kind of ate itself. Itself imploded really because once all the new atheists had agreed we don't like god they then couldn't agree on anything else like well do we believe in feminism do we believe in you know transgender suddenly it all got extremely messy and everyone fell out with each other are we just free thinking you know sort of uh, people or are we these uh, you know uh, atheism plus brights who are going to transform the world with our um revolutionary you know um and and so so um I think it was a good lesson in the fact that um, uh, we we are um, we we can't simply do away with God and expect that science will fill the vacuum. That was the assumption, um, and and you quickly realise that science can be used in all kinds of ways. Um, it's a neutral thing. Uh, it's really about the the starting assumptions of the person using it as to as to what direction it'll go in, and. And a lot of people, I think there has been this new conversation now, especially among us, some of those secular thinkers you mentioned, you know, we've already talked about Tom Holland, but yes, Douglas Murray, Jordan Peterson is obviously a significant example. Um, and, and many others who have sort of um, said, okay, they've, they've kind of basically acknowledged, I'm not a Christian, I'm a kind of a secular person, but I don't like the new atheism. It's not offering any answers. Uh, it's not speaking to people's actual needs. 
um, they recognize that culture has divided into a warring mass of, uh, you know, culture wars and um, simply saying God doesn't exist doesn't actually help anything. Um, and in fact, what actually takes the place of the Christian narrative is all kinds of individual narratives, um, other ideologies, um, which are basically, you know, have this quasi religious nature, you know, the, this is my core identity, uh, what Tom Wright calls, you know, modern forms of Gnosticism, essentially. And, um, and so the in the book, I'm trying to trace just some of who these key voices are, and why some of them are actually coming to reappreciate and reinvestigate the Christian worldview, the Christian narrative, and realize that the new atheists threw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, there were some genuine valid concerns about religion, but people are intrinsically religious and people will gravitate towards something religious. That's it's kind of it's almost it's in our nature. But the problem is what kind of a religion are you going to replace it with? And what a lot of people like Murray and Holland and Peterson and others are pointing out is is it gets replaced with this extremely um, unforgiving uh, uh, zero sum kind of game of of basically if you're not with us you're against us kind of um, forms of of religiosity and um, and so yeah I I think there is an an extraordinary opportunity for the church if it's willing to engage um because there is this meaning crisis people atheism didn't answer it um people are still desperately hungry for spiritual reality for something that satisfies their soul and and i believe the church has the answer um and i think uh, we need to be aware that people aren't so much asking now give me evidence that god exists um which was kind of the debate that was happening with the new atheists uh, they're, they're much more asking, how do I make sense of my life? Is there a narrative? Is there a, a way of, of living in the world that makes sense of my life? And the answer is still God. The answer is still Jesus. But it's um, but it's how do we engage those people who are on that journey? And, you know, again, it's been well documented in various parts of the internet, but Jordan Peterson, you know, has had this extraordinary audience that flocked to him, especially young men, um, looking for meaning, looking for purpose. And he has basically been pointing them to the Bible and saying, it's all in there, folks. Um, now he's got this particular kind of psychological, you know, biocultural kind of way in which he delivers it. But basically he's he sort of seems to be saying, um, you know, you can't really improve on the way that the kind of the person of Jesus and the way that the Bible kind of presents the story of what it is to be human. And I just think there's a, a, a tremendous opportunity for the church to, to sort of reach a generation who are still looking for meaning uh, in, in the world today. Mm, I mean, and um, then with those individuals, so Peterson, for example, as yet doesn't believe in the physical resurrection and um, the struggle of this and there's almost a sense of fatalism I find in some of these figures that oh we'd love to but we can't believe this and I suppose in many ways it comes from uh, even culturally speaking from a couple of hundred years where physicalism in different forms has been so do dominant that we can't even conceive of miracles and transcending the laws of nature and things like that but uh, what, what advice then would you give to people who are open at least? So Peterson takes this kind of Kantian approach where, uh, approach where he says, it, maybe it happens, it extends to that level. Then you have someone like Peugeot comes along and says, actually it does extrapolate out. Mm. Um, so what would you say to people? Because I, I know people who've come from physicalist, transhumanist, different backgrounds mm. to actually cross the line. What sort of advice would you give to people like that who are yeah. drawn on the work of those figures and being open to these new um, ways of viewing history mm. and experience in the world? Yeah, I, I mean, everyone will be different, I suppose. But I think I think you're right. Generally speaking, I think we, we have been so kind of fed the kind of scientific materialist kind of worldview <laughs> that um, it's very difficult to take off those glasses and put on a new set of spectacles, uh, a different way of engaging the world. But I think people are starting to do that. They're starting to question that, that is the only way of, of understanding and engaging the world. I think people are certainly starting to realize uh, that way of engaging the world won't 
get me anywhere in terms of actually meaning or purpose. Um, and it's, it's, it, it can only answer a very limited set of questions. Um, and so I think it is about giving people almost permission to say, um, you can you can step into a different way of of looking at reality and that doesn't make you anti-intellectual or uh somehow you know non-scientific um it's just that that way of looking at the world is useful for for some things but patently not good for for lots of other things like meaning and purpose and ultimate questions and um and i think you know you you do see people who make that journey and, and you who kind of cross the line and and it's it's not about compartmentalizing like in this area of my life i'm believe in science and in this area of my life i believe in god or religion or whatever um it, it's 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 seeing that um i suppose they're all the, the unified whole in a way um of 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 how it all fits together i, I think people like um alistair mcgrath have been very ha helpful in this um in seeing the way that that we don't have to kind of create these false dichotomies and um and ultimately, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's very hard. Yeah, I, I think you know when I'm sure you've seen that that interview with Peterson and Padu when Peterson gets quite emotional um, talking about the person of Jesus. But there is Christianity does have this unique contribution of of the the person who claimed to be God and this meeting place between the physical world he was a real man and the spiritual world he was God. And, and the fact that in his teachings, influence, legacy, death and resurrection, we have this kind of very clear, arguable evidence that he, vindic he vindicated those claims and that, that this was a true meeting of heaven and earth in Jesus Christ. And, and I, I would just, I suppose, invite people to look at the evidence for that, but also to be willing to... You, you have to at some point step out of a kind of purely analytical scientific frame of reference to be able to engage what that actually means um you, you're going to have to at some point engage your your soul with it uh your heart with it as well as your mind with it to for it to kind of um mean something for it to become true um and uh I think that's the challenge. I think that's actually the challenge very often for intellectuals and especially for these, you know, public intellectuals like, like Murray and Peterson and, and whoever, who, who kind of feel the itch, who feel the kind of how un, uninteresting life is if the atheist story is true in a sense, how meaningless it is certainly. Um, and they want it to be true. They kind of want it to be true, but they also, it does involve a kind of humility. It means I, I, I am not the master of my own destiny and I cannot basically rule things through my intellect. There is something beyond my intellect that I'm going to have to submit it to. And that's, that I think is actually a hard thing for, especially for intellectuals to do because they are so used to being top dog in that particular area. And, and when you come to Jesus, you have to submit it all. And that's, that's a really hard thing. It's, it's a humbling thing. I think it's extremely good for us actually mm -hmm. to do that um and ultimately it 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 puts intellect in its proper relationship to god and to other people um and stops it being essentially used as a tool of power but it can be used as a means of grace by god but it um is a i, th I think it's just difficult for people to do that you know for mm -hmm. certain types of people to do that so i can see where the the, the the wrestling comes from in that way mm -hmm. i mean hey, i know you have to go now justin and i really appreciate your time today so just before we go i want to ask you where can viewers or listeners find out more about you and your work once more thank you so much it's been a real pleasure chatting with you mark i'm sorry i've gone on so long with my answers Andrea, and not got you. to nearly <laughs> nearly half the questions that, that you wanted to get to in this but um yeah, basically, if you type in, if you Google unbelievable question mark and Justin Briley, it, it'll come, you'll come up with the unbelievable show. Um, we're available as a podcast. Um, we're on YouTube as well. The actual show page um, is premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable. Um, we are actually going to be in the process um, in the coming year of, of revamping a lot of what we do and kind of having a bespoke website, which will encompass a lot of our theology and apologetics work with with other podcasts i run like the ask and to write anything podcast and 
Uh, we've launched this year a C.S. Lewis podcast with Alistair McGrath, and we've got a lot of exciting plans um, in the pipeline. So, so look out for all of that. But yeah, podcast and, and YouTube is a good good place to, to start with. Um, there's my book, um, uh, which is called Unbelievable? Question mark. Why after ten years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian? Uh, I can give you a link that you can pop in the podcast for that where people can get hold of that as well and finally the big conversation which i've mentioned which is a sort of video series from unbelievable uh that's got its own website called the big conversation dot show mm, glory to god thank you justin god bless great you. lovely to meet you mark <laughs>